afternoon. Um, I'll, I'll start by um, just giving you a brief introduction of what we're going to do today. Um, the presentation is going to um, be in two sections. Um, the first part that I'll carry out myself is the summary of the RED with highlights of the differences between the RED and the RNTT directive. And when I've finished, I'll hand over to Hilton Carr, who's our certification manager, and um, he'll go through the details of the transition rules and our implementation of the RED. Anyway, the, um, the approach for the, um, for the RED, the general principles, they're very similar to the existing RNTG directive. It's um, all about compliance with a set of essential requirements. The article numbers are exactly the same, 3.1A health and safety, 3.1B EMC, 3.2 radio, and 3.3 additional requirements where they're invoked by the European Commission. Um, there's a general principle that harmonized standards, i.e. standards that are listed in the official journal, um, give an automatic presumption of conformity with the essential requirements. Um, and there, there's a set of conformity assessment procedures. There's internal production control, which is a self-declaration procedure. There's assessment of technical documentation by a notified body. And in the RED, this is called the type examination certification procedure. And there's full quality assurance approval. As, as in the RNTT directive. And as with the RNTT directive, there's a requirement to use a notified body where no radio or Article 3.3 home life standard exists. Um, there are a couple of definitions. Placing on the market was a definition that was, was already there in um, the RNTT directive. This was the general um, principle of first making available product on the um, European Union market. However, there's a, now an additional definition this making available on the market, and that relates to any supply um, of radio equipment for distribution in the course of a commercial activity. And my view is the, the reasoning for having this separation of these two definitions is that there can be control on both the placing of the on the market activity from you know, by a manufacturer or importer, and also the making available activity. Um, by distributors, so this, this gives market surveillance authorities some power to actually um, control what distributors are supplying to the market. Um, as far as the scope of the, R the RED is concerned, um, it all relates to products that fit within the definitions for equipment, so the radio equipment, and this is slightly different from the RNTG directive, because this is, about, this is about equipment which intentionally emits and or receives radio waves for the purpose of radio communication and or radio determination. And there's a definition for radio communication, and that means communication by means of radio waves, and radio determination is about position fixing um, equipment by, by, by making use of the properties of the radio waves. Um, there's a change in the definition of radio waves, and that means electromagnetic waves of frequencies lower than 3,000 gigahertz, i.e. there's no lower frequency limit. In the RNTT directive, there's a lower frequency limit of 9 kilohertz, and that lower frequency limit's been removed. I think it's, it's also worth mentioning that, when, that for the scope of radio equipment, it does include equipment which receives so it's, it's receive only equipment comes in as well as transceivers and transmitters. Okay, thank you, Hilton. Okay. Now, all radio receivers, that includes broadcast radio and TV receivers, um, are within the scope of the RED. Now, previously, broadcast radio and TV receivers were excluded from the RNTT directive in, um, in Annex 1. Um, but now they're all within the scope of the RED, um, and so whereas previously they would have been covered by the EMC and low voltage directives, they now need they will now need to meet the RED. Um, telecommunications terminal equipment, fixed line terminal equipment, that is, for example, such as um, simple PSTN telephones or ADSL modems, they're now outside the scope of the RED. 
and as a result, they're within the scope of the EMC Directive and the LVD. And there's a new exclusion um, in Article 1, and that's for custom-built evaluation kits intended to be used by professionals at research and development facilities. And here are examples of the sort of equipment that's covered by the RED. Most of these are traditional um, radio equipment that we've been dealing with under the RNTG directive, but added to this list are broadcast radio and TV receivers. Um, but it's not just that the traditional radio equipment um, that, that's covered by the RED. For example, combined equipment. Um, the presence of an inbuilt radio module makes the whole product radio equipment. So combined equipment is radio equipment. And a product cannot be separated into separate parts for which different directives apply. Any equipment, which includes a radio transmitter and or radio receiver, is radio equipment as defined in the RED and is subject to the RED unless specifically excluded by Article 1 of the RED or excluded by another directive. For example, a vending machine with a GSM radio module to reorder um, the stock is totally subject to the RED. The essential requirements, that they're in um, Article 3 of the directive. Um, there are slight changes um, to this. Um, they're brought in in Article 3.8 the protection of domestic animals and the protection of property. Um, again, with no voltage limit supplying as with the RNTT directive, EMC is very much the same as the RNTT directive. But for Article 3.2, the radio essential requirement, um, it's not only effective use of the radio spectrum, but radio equipment has to support the efficient use of the radio spectrum. So this is quite an important change to the essential requirements. And again, there's an Article 3.3 .3 for additional requirements, and I'll come on to those next. Okay. This list is very much the same as the previous list of the RNTT directive, but there, there are two important additions. Um, in 3.3a, um, that's radio equipment interworks with accessories, in particular with common chargers. And this, this allows the European Commission um, to introduce or to mandate the requirement for a common charger for things like mobile phones um, in accordance with what was a voluntary MOU. If, if necessary, they can now mandate it through Article 3.3a. Um, and 3.3i is, is about um, radio equipment that supports certain features to ensure that software can only be loaded onto the radio equipment where it's compliant, where it's compliant, the combination of the hardware and software is compliant. Again, Article 4 is about combinations of uh, radio equipment and software. Um, the European Commission can decide to invoke Article 4 uh, for certain categories or classes of radio equipment if, if they feel it's necessary, and that's about the compliance of intended combinations of radio equipment and software. So that's, that's compliance with the essential requirements. And Article 5 is about registration. Again, the Commission can decide what categories or classes of radio equipment um, that need to be um, registered within the central system of registration. And that's aimed at categories of equipment which are affected by low levels of compliance. And that's not for another, um, another three or four years. They're allowed to do that from the 12th of June 2018. It's worth mentioning that it's the, it's the low level of compliance. So it's, we're not talking about high risk radio devices. It's radio devices where the, the TCF or, or by actual testing, they demonstrate they, uh, the, that type of equipment has a low level of compliance generally. Okay. So it could, Okay, so this, this is the general principle for, for radio equipment in the RED. The same as the RNTT directive. There's a definition of essential requirements 
and then there's a conformity assessment procedure based on compliance with the essential requirements. Compliance is against essential requirements, not directly against standards. However, compliance with appropriate home life standards, i.e. standards listed under the, in the OJ, in the, in the official journal under the RED, that gives an automatic presumption of conformity with the appropriate essential requirements. Okay, the RED conformity assessment procedures. First, the manufacturer needs to perform a conformity assessment of the radio equipment with the intention of meeting the essential requirements. And it needs to take into account all intended operating conditions. However, there's a, a difference to the RED for, because for health and safety, Article 3.1a, the assessment also takes into account the foreseeably, foreseeable, reasonably foreseeable conditions. So it's not just about intended use, it's about the likely use of the equipment. This doesn't mean that they all, all, all the intended operating conditions need to be tested, but the assessment should take them into account, for example, by testing worst case and then justifications for other operating conditions. Um, and also, where the equipment's capable of taking different configurations, the RED says that the conformity assessment shall confirm whether the radio equipment meets the essential requirements in all possible configurations. And the words shall confirm um, mean some, probably means something more than a technical justification, probably testing. And there's some specific market surveillance requirements. Um, these are straightforward um, non-compliances that market surveillance organizations find when they're carrying out their surveillance activities. Um, they're listed in the slides, for example, problems with the CE marking, no notified body identification number when the FQA procedure is used, technical documentation not available or not complete, um, incorrect marking on the equipment, such as type name, back to serial number, and manufacturer or importer name, intended use information, and identification of economic operators not supplied, or when, when it's in place, non-compliance with the registration procedure. And the directive allows for market withdrawal or recall for persistent non-compliance with this requirement. And within the directive are the various economic operators defined, um, manufacturers, authorized representatives, importers, and distributors. And defining these activities and having um, precise responsibilities for these various economic operators allows market surveillance um, authorities to actually take action in the case of non-compliance. The various obligations, such as taking corrective action, if there's a reason to consider the radio equipment non-compliant, um, notifying national market surveillance authorities when there's the, the potential of a risk of non for non-compliance, and cooperating with national market surveillance authorities and one additional requirement, be able to identify any economic operator who supplied them with radio equipment or to whom they've supplied radio equipment. Now, manufacturers' responsibilities, the first one is, is new, and that's to ensure that radio equipment can be operated in at least one member state. Now, in the past, we've had um, activities where manufacturers were, have wanted to tell the notified bodies to certify products, even if there's no intention of using them in the European Union or is not capable of being used in the European Union. This now prevents that happening. To actually, for compliance with the RED, the equipment has to be able to be operated in at least one member state. There's an obligation, when deemed appropriate, to carry out sample testing for the health and safety of end, end users and to keep a register of non-conforming radio equipment and radio equipment recalls and keep distributors informed. Um, making compliance documentation available to surveillance authorities on request in a language easily understood by that authority. They're not saying that the 
compliance documentation has to be available in all of the languages of, of all of the intended markets, but it needs to be in a language understood by the Market Surveillance Authority that's requested it. Um, the red equipment needs to bear the manufacturer's name and postal address, or you know, if, it, if it can't go on the equipment because of the size or nature of the equipment, on packaging or documentation, and a single point address is required. And as far as instructions for use are concerned, it needs to include or define the software which allows the radio equipment to operate as intended. That's, that's an additional requirement in the instructions for use. Just before we go on, I do want to emphasize that it's the manufacturer's name and postal address. You cannot just list a, an, e, uh, an email address or an internet address. You have to provide a, a proper postal address. Yep, thank you, thank you Helen. Um, some new information is required um, to go with the ready equipment, um, and that's the frequency bands in which the radio equipment operates, that needs to go in the user information, and the maximum RF power that's transmitted by the radio equipment in those bands. Again, there needs to be a copy of the DFC, the Declaration of Conformity, supplied with each radio equipment or a simplified DFC, which is def it's defined in the directive. Um, it's a simple statement of compliance, but where a simplified DFC is provided, it also needs to contain the exact internet address where the full EU DFC can be obtained. There's an obligation on the manufacturer that if he believes that the radio equipment's not in conformity with the RED, they need to immediately take corrective actions necessary to bring it into conformity to withdraw it or recall it, if appropriate. And if, if the equipment presents a risk, to notify the competent national authorities in the member states where, where they've made the equipment available on the market. Another economic operator is the authorised representative. And this is where a manufacturer may, in the form of a written mandate, appoint an authorised representative. Um, there, are part, there are some activities which can't be delegated to an authorised representative, and that, that's um, designing and manufacturing the product to meet the essential requirements and drawing the technical documentation. That can't form part of the mandate, but the mandate can allow, well, should allow the authorised representative to do at least the following, and that's keeping the declaration of conformity and technical documentation available for national market surveillance authorities, and, and that's for 10 years after the last item of the radio equipment has been placed on the market. Provide, uh, following a reason request from a national authority, provide the information, the, authority with that information and documentation necessary to demonstrate conformity with the directive and also to cooperate with national authorities. I, I'm going to emphasize this as a written mandate. Previously, there's been no formalized requirement for, to appoint a, a North House representative. Now, it's very clearly uh, a document which the uh, market surveillance authorities can ask to see. Thank you. Another economic um, operator's obligations defined, and that's for importers. And there's a requirement on importers that should only place compliant radio equipment on the market and ensure the appropriate RED conformity assessment procedures have been carried out. They need to indicate on the equipment their name, registered trade name, or registered trademark, and the postal address at which they can be contacted on the radio equipment or if, if that's not possible on the packaging or the documentation that comes with the equipment. And that even includes cases where importers have to open up packaging to place their name address on the radio equipment. Again, there are obligations to carry out sample testing and investigate problems uh, when deemed appropriate um, as far as health and safety are concerned. Um, and there's an obligation if they feel that products that are placed on the market is not in conformity to the ROD, they'll 
follow the appropriate corrective action which is defined in the directive. So they have to, have to act with due care in relation to the requirements of the RED. I'm repeating myself here, sorry. No, that's what I need to yeah. yeah. And this is um, items where a product is modified or it's sold under a separate trademark or trademark or name of the importer or distributor. The importer or distributor needs to be considered and take on the responsibilities as if they're the manufacturer for the purposes of the RED if they do place equipment under their own name on the market or they modify the ready equipment that's already on the market in such a way that compliance is affected. The effect of this is that an importer does that, he must have access to a TCF, the technical documentation, and, and, the, and the various changes he's made. He must generate his own DFC and also have his own labelling. So it's not just a matter of putting your own name on the product. There's uh, a number of other obligations because the market surveillance authorities will go to him, not the original manufacturer, if there's any concern. Yes, agreed. We now move on to the conformity assessment procedures which are invoked in the RED. There's three of them. As I said before, there's the internal production control, there's no notified body involvement. This is a self-declaration procedure. There's the EU type examination and conformity to type procedure. Um, there's notified body involvement there to assess the technical documentation. And there's full quality assurance. This is where a notified body assesses design, manufacturing inspection, and test procedures. This, this is a quality system approval. Alex 2. Um, under ANS 2, the uh, internal production control procedure, the manufacturer compiles the technical documentation. That's defined later. Um, he needs to put in place manufacturing processes and monitor the processes to ensure that products continue to comply with the ready equipment directive. He affixes the CE marking of the directive to each item of ready equipment that complies with the directive. And he issues a DFC, a declaration of conformity, for each ready equipment type and keeps that with the technical documentation for 10 years after the last item of radio equipment has been placed on the market. Um, these obligations for CE marking and the DFC may be carried out by his authorised representative, uh, provided they're specified in the authorised representative mandate. Again, Annex 3, this is the EU type examination procedure. And again, the manufacturer compiles the technical documentation. He submits applica an a his application for um, type examination to a single notified body of his own choice. Then the notified body examines the technical documentation and supporting evidence to assess the compliance with the RED. So the notified body determines whether the technical documentation indicates compliance with the essential requirements and the rest of the RED. If compliance, the notified body issues an EU type examination certificate. Now, there are some obligations on the notified body, and that's to maintain its technical knowledge. And this is um, so that he can determine that um, a product that is certified may lo no longer comply with the requirements of the directive, and it's also determine whether those changes require any further investigation. And, and if so, and then if I body needs to inform the manufacturer that there are changes which may affect compliance of the product. Also, there's an obligation on the manufacturer who's obtained a type examination certificate from a notified body. The manufacturer needs to inform the notified body of all modifications to the product that may affect compliance with the essential requirements or the conditions for the validity of the tech of the type examination certificate. Again, this is a new requirement um, compared with the RNTT directive. Under the RNTT directive, once a manufacturer received uh, a notified body opinion, um, he could then go away and um, control the compliance of the, of the product himself. Under the RED, 
the manufacturer needs to inform the notified body of all modifications that may affect compliance. Then the manufacturer's got to keep a copy of the tab examination certificates and the technical documentation for 10 years after the last item of the equipment has been placed on the market. And continuing compliance, DFCC marking obligations, they're the same as Annex 2. Uh, I can I make some one, one thing worth mentioning about modifications. We will have a scheme which we will be, we're modifying currently, but we'll be announcing in the new year a revised CLE scheme, Certification Engineers and Engineers scheme, and that's one where we delegate the uh, approval of certain types of modifications to personnel within an organisation. So those of you who might be interested in that, watch this spot. We will be making announcements about that uh, early next year. Thank you. And the final conformity assessment procedure is for quality assurance. This, the general principles are very much the same as the RNTT directive. FQA approval, the quality system approval of the manufacturer's processes which permit the application of the CE mark to products within the scope of the FQA. So you've got a quality management system approval which permits the CE marking to go on the product. It's very similar to the RNTT directive, apart from when the manufacturer submits his application for a full quality assurance approval, he needs to include a sample set of technical documentation for each product type, and when the notified body carries out design, audits, it needs to include an assessment of the product technical compliance documentation to verify the manufacturer's ability to identify applicable requirements and to carry out product assessments. There's a requirement in Article 21 for technical documentation. So First point, it needs to contain all the relevant data to ensure that the ready equipment complies with the essential requirements. The technical documentation should be drawn up before ready equipment is placed on the market and something that's new to the RED, it needs to be continuously updated. And the documentation and correspondence relating to EU type examination procedure should be drawn up in an official language of the member state in which the notified body is established or in a language acceptable to that body. So for us, that will be English. Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Clarification. Um, when, um, during a market surveillance activity, uh, a market surveillance authority has determined that the technical documentation doesn't comply with the directive, the market surveillance authority has the right to ask the manufacturer or importer to have a test performed by a body acceptable to the market surveillance authority, and that's at the expense of the manufacturer or importer. This is a new requirement. This is to verify compliance with the essential requirements, the market surveillance activity. And I mentioned about documentation being continuously updated, the note at the bottom of the slide. As a minimum, we expect technical documentation to update it when a product or a standard has changed. Okay, now we now come on to the contents of the set of technical documentation. This is in Article 17 and also in Annex 5. And this is very much like we have for the RNTT Directive Annex 4 TCF, but there are some additional requirements. And, and Again, there's a general description of the radio equipment, a statement of all the intended operating conditions, but in addition to that, for health and safety essential requirements, the statement must also to take into account the reasonably foreseeable conditions of use. So it's not just about, for health and safety, it's not just about intended use, it's reasonably foreseeable conditions. Again, technical documentation, Design and manufacturing drawings are required, descriptions and explanations necessary for the understanding of those drawings and about the operation of the radio equipment. Um, a list of OJ listed harmonized standards used and where harmonized standards have not been used, the solutions that have been used to meet the essential requirements. Again, a DFC, um, 
where the Annex 3 type examination procedure has been used, that needs to include a copy of the EU type examination certificate issued by a notified body, results of any design calculations, examinations carried out, and test reports, and an explanation of the equipment operating in at least one member state. So this is the point I made earlier, that ready equipment needs to operate in at least one member state to be, to be able to be placed on the market under the RED. Okay, the Declaration of Conformity, this is in Article 18, and this is a statement um, that the product complies with the essential requirements and that they've been demonstrated. There's a structure set out in, in Annex 6. There's a requirement for it to be continuously updated, and there's a need for it to be translated into language or languages required by the member state in which the ready equipment is placed or made available on the market. Now, there's also uh, a requirement that a single EU declaration of conformity should be drawn up in respect of all Union Act or all, all directives. However, in Recycle 42, it, it does actually state that this single EU DFC may be a dossier made up of relevant individual declarations of conformity. And now come on to the contents of the DFC. This is in Annex 6. Again, this is description of the equipment, product type, batch or serial number, the name and address of the manufacturer or authorised representative, um, a statement that the DFC is issued under the sole responsibility of the manufacturer, um, the object of the declaration. This is, this is identification of the ready equipment. This allows traceability, it allows market surveillance, uh, authorities to identify the equipment. It could include a colour image if, if that's necessary for identification. Um, and a statement that this object or ready equipment is in conformity with the relevant legislation. Um, that's the RED and other union harmonised legislation where applicable. Uh, it is references to relevant harmonised standards and the versions used or references to other technical specifications against which conformity has been declared. So there's a requirement to specify the version of the standards used and where applicable, where a notified body is used, the name of the notified body and the identification number of the notified body, the activities performed such as type examination and the fact that he's issued a type examination certificate. And a description of accessories and components including software which allow the, the equipment to operate as intended, and that's covered by the DFC. Again, I mentioned the simplified DFC earlier on. This is in Annex 7, and where the simplified DFC is provided, it's a simple statement. You know, hereby, we declare that the radio equipment is in compliance with the RED. Um, and the full text is, is made available at the following internet address. There's a requirement to be continuously updated, um, but I assume that a simple statement is difficult to update on, on, a, on a continuous basis, but at least the, the reference DFC at the, at the, on the internet would need to be continuously updated. Then it needs to be translated into language or languages required by the member state where it's been placed or made available on the market. I think it's worth saying that the DFC, the language is, is not every language of every state. Again, it's a language which the member state says it will accept. So, for example, Ireland may say it will accept uh, English and not require translation into the Irish language. They could make that decision. The other comment is, if you use the simplified DFC option, be che check if your, any other directive is applicable. Because if any other directive is applicable which doesn't permit the simplified DFC, then you can't use the simplified DFC option for the RED. You have to use the full DFC mm -hmm. uh, for the RED. Okay, thank you. We can't see marking. 
this, this changes compared with the RNTT directive. Um, the CE on its own with no notified body number is used for the Annex 2 internal production control procedure and for the Annex 3 tab examination procedure. Um, previously under um, the RNTT directive, where a notified body had examined or assessed the technical documentation, it permitted the use of a notified body number um, under the Annex 4 TCF assessment procedure. In this case, under the type examination procedure, it's just the CE as a marking. Um, the RED also permits um, the height of the CE marking to be le less than five millimeters, provided it, may, it remains visible and legible. And that's, that's if, if the nature of the radio equipment require, um, requires it to be smaller than five millimeters. Um, and then the next point is if the Annex 4 FQA procedure is used, the notified body number is used with the CE marking. So the CE zero, for BABT, the CE 0168 mark, that can only be used for Annex 4 FQA when tubs of BABT is used as notified body. And as far as marking is concerned, the alert mark of the RNTTU directive goes under the RED. There's no alert mark for the use of non-harmonized frequency bands. And an issue which has been contentious over a number of years, and that's electronic labeling. It's not currently permitted. They're in Recycle 47, there's the, there's the option for the European Commission to review it at some time in, in the future, but it's not currently permitted under the Radio Equipment Directive. Okay. I'll now, now hand you over to Hilton, who will um, talk about the transition arrangements and the subs of BABT implementation of the Radio Equipment Directive. Thank you, Les. That, I believe, sets the scene quite nicely for the second half of the talk. So the transition arrangements. The first thing is that the RED itself was agreed in April 2014. It will come into effect across Europe on the 13th of June 2016. No country is permitted to bring it in early. So it's a unified date for everybody. The RTTE is currently in effect, and it will cease to be valid on the 13th of June 2017. There is, in effect, a year's transition. And you've got the statement there from the EU, uh, or rather from the RED, about the transition periods. Those those words themselves have been interpreted and confirmed by the EU Commission. So now what we're going to look at is the applicable legislation um, and how it applies to various things. So we're going to look at equipment which are, uh, will go from RNTTE to RED, Equipment, the transition rules for equipment currently sub, subject to the EMC and LBD directives. Equipment subject to the RTTE, which, will, which is outside the scope of the RED. And equipment which is subject to EMC and will become, become part of the scope of the RED. So we'll be looking at those four different types of transitions and the rules which uh, are appropriate for them. So the first one, which is probably the majority of you, is the RNTT transition, and it's for products which are within the scope of the RET, RED and which are already at the moment in the scope of the RNTTE. And examples of that would be things like mobile phones, non-solar marine radio, radio-based stations, GPS receivers, and short-range devices. And basically, where compliance has been established under the RTT directive, products may continue to be placed on the market, as supplied into the marketplace, until the 13th of June 2016, under the RTTE. Where the products fall out within the scope of the RED, 
which were those ones above R, they, the same products may continue to be placed in the market using the compliance against the RTTE until the 13th of June 2017. So, but the, but the above products, you could continue using the RTTE compliance route till 2017. Products placed on the market after the 12th of June 2017 must be compliant to the RED. So if they're first placed on the market after that, and that would include compliance with the RED essential requirements and the administrative requirements of the directive. However, where the products require modification, the current products you supply now require modification, the compliance may be re-established on the RTT until the 13th of June 2017. So it's not just you could continuing, you can actually modify products which are covered by the RTT until 2017. Likewise, you may introduce new products into the marketplace citing the RTT until the 13th of June 2017. So even though the RED is in place, you may still use the compliance routes of the RTTE until 2017. We now look at products, which is just slightly outside the general scope, but we need to look at this before we look at one star items. Products which are currently under the EMC Directive and the LVD, or maybe just the EMC Directive. Where compliance has been established to the relevant directives, the relevant 2004 or 2006 directives, they may continue to be placed on the market until the 20th of April 2016 under those directives. After, 2000, after 20th of April 2016, those products must be compliant to the EMC Directive, the 2014 version, and where relevant, the 2014 version of the LVD. So there is, there is no transition overlap. So before that date, they have to meet the old EMC and LVD. After the 20th of April, they have to meet the new one. And those are products which are currently under the EMC and LVD directive. We then followed on that thought where there are some products which are currently under the EMC directive and the LVD which fall within the scope of the RED. And we've talked about them earlier. These are broadcast radio television receivers radio receivers or transmitters operating below 9 kilohertz. All of those were outside the RTTE but are in within the, the RED. So where compliance has been established to the relevant directives of AMC LVD, they may continue to be placed on the market until the 20th of April 2016 under those, you know, under the, the, two, the 2004, 2006 directives. After the 20th of April and, and until the 13th of June 2016, the products must be compliant to the new EMC Directive 2014 or, where relevant, the LVD 2014. However, products placed on the market, the, the products which come within this, this category, which are placed on the market between the 13th of June 2016 and the 12th of June 2017 must follow the compliance rules of either the RED or the 2014 LVD EMC. And after 2017, the 12th of June 2017, those products, the broadcast television receivers, must be, can only be provided with compliance to the RED. So I'll go through that very, to sort of summarise, you have a period from now till April where you can use the current EMC and LVD. After April, after April 2016 until June 2017, you may use the new EMC and LVD. After the, the 13th of June 
2016, you could uh, buy the product in compliance to the RED. So you have got not one, but two transitions to consider for these products. One of which you can't, you have to make immediately. One of which you have a parallel period for about 14 months. And then we got products which are currently under the RTTE, but which will be after, to, after June 2016, subject to the EMC and LVD. And the products, these products are, for example, the telephones and terminal equipment, such as wireless, PSC and tele, telephones, and ADSL modems. Where their compliance has been established the RT directive, they may continue to be placed in the market until the 13th of June 2016. And that's key, it's 2016 for these products. After June 2016, the products must be compliant to the EMC directive uh, 2014 and the LVD 2014 where relevant. So there is no transition for these such products. On the, on the, after the 13th of June, they cannot use the RTTA because the RED is in place, but they're not subject to the RED, so the RED um, overlap, which is in the legislation of the RED, is, is, not, is not applicable, and they have to then go back to the, the rules for the EMC and LVD. We're going to very briefly through this again, which Les mentioned. A product's placed on the market when it's made available the first time at the union market. So placing on the market reserved for either the manufacturer or the importer. They're the only economic agency who place products on the market. Products made, of, made available on the market must comply with the applicable union. So the, the main compliance occurs at the point of placing on the market. But the, the, when the place is made available, they have the the person who's making it available has to ensure that it, it met the requirements when it was placed on the market. And ma making available on the market, the concept is for each individual product. Consequently, a product type has been supplied before the union harmonization laid down new, new mandatory requirements entered into force. Individual after that. So, Basically, if you place a product on the market before the, thir before the 13th of, uh, of, of June 2016, you have to meet the RMTTA. If you place it on the market on the sort of early June 2017, you could still place it on the market using the RMTTA, but you cannot then place products you've manufactured even if you manufactured them before, if you're placing them on the market after, the fact that it may have been built before is irrelevant. It's when you place it actually on the market, when it leaves the place of where it's been manufactured into the distribution chain. At that point, it's been made available. So you've got this diagram showing basically the manufacturing importer can be placed on the market Distributor could put, there could be a distribution chain of more than one distributor, and they're making available on the market. So we're going to look at the transition. This means products may be established compliance and be supplied with the DFC after the 13th of June 2017, all raid equipment must be compliant with the RED and may longer replace the market. Any product designed originally, uh, where you've originally got compliance with it must be reassessed under the RED if you wish to carry on supply of the product after the 13th of June. Now, within the transition, is each EU member state must enact le national legislation into their own legal framework. And the target for this is, 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 is prior to the 13th of June. And in the UK, it's the department, the DBIS, they're responsible 
And they not, but however, they normally only enact directives close to the final date. So we're not expecting UK legislation much before the end of quarter one, possibly start of quarter two of 2016. Now we then start looking at harmonised standards. The scope of the ID differs from the RMTTA, which means that some additional standards are required and existing standards require additional requirements. You've already seen the essential requirements have been changed. There have been additions on safety to include animals and property. There's the the, the addition of the effective use of the spectrum and the receivers, and also there's some additional 3.3 requirements. So that means there's quite a lot of standardization work needed to review and amend them. The standards uh, already cited under the RT directive, they're being reviewed and will be published under the RED, uh, but not as they stand. There will be changes to them to, to take account of the changed essential requirements. However, Etsy have stated it's not possible to complete all the standards in the time requested by the time the RED comes in place. And likewise, some standards produced by Senlac will require amendment, and we don't know when, what time, when they will be appearing. And we know that, but we know the Commission has mandated some new standards also because of the receiver-only equipment, broadcast receivers. There was a standardization request issued in August 2015, which was very late in the process. And basically, work is got underway. There's, they intend to have standards by the 13th, 15th of March for, for sound and uh, TV broadcast receivers, radio equipment operating below 9K, and radio determination equipment. But there's, we're also working on health and safety standards to include foreseeable conditions. So there's a lot of work going on in there to do with all the standardization. The harmonized standards list that we currently have for the RNTT will continue in effect for the RNTTA until either replaced by another RNTT harmonized list or the, or the 13th of June comes into effect. 30th of June 2017. The Commission have said they will publish a harmonised standards list for the RED prior to the 13th of June. We don't know when it's coming, but they also know because a lot of standards will not be available, it will require updates. So we're not expecting an annual update, we're expecting maybe two or three in the, in the, year, in the time following that, that year. Etsy has stated the harmonised list is uh, in the RED, the, 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 Etsy have stated that unlike the RTTE, the harmonised standards listed in the RJ under the LVD and EMC directives cannot be used to show conformance with Article 3.1a or 3.1b of the RED. It, it means that the only, the only harmonised standards listed in the OJ and the RT can be used to, to show conformity to this, that particular directives. Standards which don't appear on the RAD list will no longer give a presumption of conformity. This basically means, I think, as it stands at the moment, many previous EMC product-specific EMC standards may not be listed under the RAD, and in that case, they would not give a presumption, of, a full presumption of conformity. However, unless specific advice has been issued by the Commission or the RDDCA, harmonised standards represent the state of the art. And the, the, the ID, compliance should be shown against the, the essential requirements, making use of the state of the art. But the conformity to harmonised standards in full gives the presumption of conformity. Means it, it should meet the, it should be the state of the art. However, for any article, a mix of harmonised and non-harmonised standards, or just a use of non-harmonised standards, may be used to establish conformity. However, where this occurs, there's no presumption of conformity related to that article. 
The technical file must therefore include a justification why compliance with the used standard is equivalent or better than the state of the art as specified in the particular harmonised standard. So if you use a product standard rather than a harmonised standard, you may have a very good justification for saying we've gone further than the harmonised standard. That would be a, a, that would be a, a reasonable justification. However, where non harmonised standards have been used, or a harmonised standard is not used in full, for either Article 3.2 or 3.3, then you're obliged to use a notified body to review your file. So I'll repeat that. If you have if you've used a non-harmonised standard or don't haven't used a harmonised standard in full for Article 3.2 or Article 3.3, then you must use a notified body. For the Article 3.1a and 3.1b, if you use non-harmonised standards, you have to provide a justification for why they meet the state of the art, but you may you may continue to self-declare if you so wish or you can use a notified body. Now, we know the definition of radio equipment doesn't allow the treating of inbuilt radio functionality to be, de de to be dealt with separately from the main equipment. We can't separate a product into parts. So now, the presence of an inbuilt radio module or component makes the whole product radio equipment. And that therefore, as we said earlier, combined equipment is radio equipment. That vending machine, the whole of the vending machine is now, called, is now treated as radio equipment. However, the ETSI ERM EMC realized that you have a set of well-designed product-specific EMC standards, which are called up under the EMC directive. So what they're proposing to do is develop a, a set of, I call them umbrella standards, which basically what they will do is they will refer to existing EMC standards for radio aid requirements, and they'll refer to existing non-radio EMC standards for other relevant requirements. And basically, there will be guidance in them as to which requirements take precedence if there is a conflict. So that means then, if you have got a refrigerator with uh, a radio module in, you can actually, you would use, the, you would use an EMC related to the radio module, and you would use an EMC standard related to the refrigerator, and you would, you would select the relevant parts and the relevant limits from each of them. And the advantage of this approach is that they don't want to have to rewrite all the product standards again. But they, the intent is to make, ensure that all the relevant EM, EMC requirements are included, rather than people uh, say, well, we're using a harmonized standard that gives us presumption of conformity for that product, and ignore the radio side or ignore the other functions. We now look at notified bodies. Notified bodies listed under the RNTTE may continue to operate until the 13th of June of 2017. Member states must designate the notified bodies under the RED prior to operating. In the UK, DBIS will, op will designate the bodies with UCAS, which have UCAS accreditation for the RED. UCAS will only accredit notified bodies when the UK statutory instrument is in place. So UCAS has, has, has assessed us satisfied with our RED implementation, but we may not obtain a full accreditation from UCAS until the statutory instrument is in place. The RED CA, which was formerly RTTCA, have been informed also of the NHC guide, which gives guidance to notified bodies on the assessment of radio equipment for which harmonized standards have not been completed. So this guide, this, we will use this guide where a harmonized standard 
has not been published under the RED. It may still be in preparation, but we'll use the guide as our measure for what we should do and how we, the approach we will take. We said the manufacturer requires that where manufacturer doesn't make use of harmonised standards in our entirety, they must be that the notified body must be involved in compliance. Where the manufacturer doesn't make use of for the Article 301A, they may self-declare. However, the consequence of the late production of the Etsy RD standard is that m many of the 3.2 and 3.3 standards will not have been published for the RED by the implementation of the RED on the 13th of June. The implication of that is that for, uh, for, the, for a period of time, many manufacturers will be required to make use of a notified body because you are not using a harmonised standard in entirety, because there is not a harmonised standard. So for the RED, people may have to come to us initially because the standards are not there. Once they appear, they then would ha you would then have the opportunity for other products to self-declare if you so wished. So, what are we doing about it and when? We've decided that we would accept applications for RED text from the 1st of March 2016. This is to give people time to get their TCFs ready, for us to review it, to establish if there are concerns about what standards have been used or whatever. It gives both parties time to have um, certificates ready in time. We, we've said the, the general principle is established by if either being issued by the harmonization, the standardization body. And we know that ETSI will be issuing standards, but obviously they, some of them may not have been listed in the harmonised standards list by that time. So if, if ETSI have issued the standard, we will treat it as though it is a harmonised standard. However, it may also you may have to use the best fit standard with a justification of relevance following the ETSI guide. And then we will do the review according to that. Now, as far as accredit is, BMT will accept testing to the final draft of standard. If Etsy have got it in the final draft and you want to start testing to that, while Etsy are going through its um, process, we are happy if the testing is done to the final draft and then we will assess against the published draft, which should not differ significantly from it. Also, that until the end of 2016, we will accept unaccredited test reports supporting the RED from test laboratories who reta retain accreditation for the equivalent standard under the RNTTA. So what we're saying there is if the lab has established compliance, has got a listed version standard for the RNTTE, the derived standard will have to be added onto its accreditation, but they have until the end of 2016 to obtain that. We will review this policy late on in 2016, and if we perceive there's still a problem with, with uh, test labs being unable to get accreditation because of the absence of standards or the standards have just been issued, we will then review this and extend the date. But our current policy is it will be the end of 2016, and we hope most labs will have obtained um, appropriate accreditations. The other thing about it is when the RED harmonised standard lists, we will review all completed jobs until the end of 2006, until, uh, until June 2016, to ensure that compliance is still valid. And we will then take appropriate measures if we find, in fact, the harmonised standards list has introduced something we didn't expect. Now, if we, if we will issue BABT type examination certificates once we're satisfied. 
for the RED. But they will have a validity date of the 13th of June 2016. In effect, that means they are not a certificate until 2016, until, until the 13th of June 2016. The paper, the paper has no validity and no no formal validity before the date. We understand it gives you confidence and it may give you some of your distributors confidence. But it, as far as a formal certificate, it will not have a formal significance until that date. And we would reserve the right to rescind certificate, which fails to meet requirements on that date. Uh, we're, we're not expecting to have to do that, but it is we're accepting that if a, if, if, some, if a very late change is made to a harmonized standard, then because we have to certify against the state of the art, at the time of the certificate is valid, then we may have to uh, rescind it or, or possibly suspend it until uh, changes are made. Some of you may be wondering why do we not, why are we not transitioning uh, some of the RTTA? Basically, we will not transition RT notified body opinions into the RED. Clients will have to apply for new certification. And the primary reason is that, um, is why, is that at the present time, clients can apply modifications to, a notified bo to, to equipment with a notified body opinion without involving ourselves. So our review may not be the review of the latest current product. Additionally, the RED has additional and some different requirements. So there would have to be a degree of delta review. So we've made the decision that for the RED that we will require a complete review of the full TCF. However, you may reuse still valid test data provided with justification. So if you've test, got tests against the RE, RNTTE, and those, for, those, for many of those tests, the requirement is the same under the RED, you may use that test data and cite it. So you might only have to do limited testing uh, against the new standard for those additional requirements. Likewise, much of the supporting documentation won't change. Your build levels, your, your critical components, they will not change. But also, some, some changes are not too difficult to implement. If you use a manual, only has about three changes needed to it. It has them, but and likewise, your labelling has very has changes, but it's not very difficult to achieve. So, we we will we work on the principle that we will need new applications. However, we will permit parallel applications, the RT RED, if you wish. It, because of the date of, of March. It's a, it's a little unlikely, but it may well be that if you wish to do that, we, we will accept. And in that case, then what we will do is we review the TCF, and we ask you to send a TCF which is compliant with the RED. And basically, the deltas, the backward deltas between the RED and the RTTE are less than the forward deltas. So you give us an RED one, and then you only have to give us a very few documents to support your request for the RNTTE. And that's the approach we'd be asking for. If you wish to apply early and say you want both. FQA, I'm, I'm going to be very brief for that because the, all the clients we have on FQA we've spoken to, if any of you are interested in FQA, please uh, ask us separate, independently and we will go through the ones. But basically, we are transferring uh, transferring the uh, FQA because the requirements are very close. And um, the FQAs will continue, the RTT FQAs will continue if the client wishes until the 13th of June. Uh, we have issued a new version of the audit standard which we'll, we can audit against for the RED. And likewise, as before, uh, the, we will issue, if, if, uh, if people are ready for an FQA approval before the 13th of June, we'll issue the FQA, the, the RED FQA approval from the 13th of June. 